Okay, so one of the projects that we have embarked upon, you and I, as a people together, one of the projects we have embarked upon is we're going to try to build or construct or rather discover an epistemological warrant that brings us from the natural to the supernatural. How are we going to do that? Well, prior to me becoming a Christian, as I've explained in times past, the night I became a Christian, that was a faith experience. Prior to me becoming a Christian, I sounded a lot like Jordan Peterson. And I was reading all, almost the exact same things. And I was becoming very, very, very intellectually convinced that there was a God. And I sounded a lot like him. And, you know, when people ask him if, if, there's, if, there's, if he's a Christian or if he believes in God, he gives you a different answer every single time you ask him. I was the exact same way. If I was hung over one morning, you know, do you believe in God? No, man, no. I would have described myself as a non at that time. Do you believe, are you religious? No, man, no. What religion do you practice? Non, non. That's what I would have said. Yeah, it's kind of obnoxious, whatever. <laughs> That's what I would have said. So if you caught me in the wrong moment, you say, you know, I'm hung over. Is there a God? No way. <laughs> you come, then you call me, you know, the night before I'm having a couple of, I'm all lit up and I'm starting to feel really warm hearted and the little drummer boy comes on. He's like, is there a God? I'm like, yeah, there's got to be, there's got to be. It just depends on what mood I was in. I would give you a different answer at different times, just like Jordan Peterson. But the whole time, I was becoming intellectually convinced that there was a God. Not faith-based convinced, intellectually convinced. Why? How? Well, here's where it gets interesting. One of the things that atheists say time and time again, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So, I say to you, Jesus rose from the dead. Why? That claim is extraordinary. <laughs> yeah, that's an extraordinary claim. Prove it. <laughs> okay. Hard to do. Why? Because extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. But what we are now going to try to do is instead of finding a faith-based warrants from the, from the natural to the supernatural, in order for you to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, the Holy Spirit would have to speak to your heart, which in and of itself is miraculous. So that would be a miracle right there. You would have to experience a miracle in order to believe a miracle. Christianity is... Asking you to believe the not plausible right from the start. Right from the jump. Believe the not plausible. Why do people do it? Because oftentimes the Holy Spirit speaks to their heart and tells them it's true. Period. Whether they're right or wrong, immaterial. In order for you to follow them down that, to, down that path, the Holy Spirit would have to speak to your heart. That in and of itself would be a miracle. So... Being rational, reasonable human beings, we are not going to count on a miracle for you to come to some sort of intellectual conviction or understanding that a God more than likely exists. See how I'm lowering the bar? Doing that on purpose. But, let's examine. In his debate with Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson said, in describing Shakespeare, and this applies to almost all other powerfully creative people, Oftentimes a creative person, this is roughly speaking what Jordan Peterson said, oftentimes a creative person will describe themselves or refer to themselves as a conduit through which divine energy pours. Bang. We're in a different place, aren't we? Now, that doesn't prove anything, of course. But that's a lot different of a claim. Oftentimes, a powerfully creative person will describe themselves as a conduit through which the divine energy pours, through which, as Peterson said it, through which um, metaphorical truths, wisdom truths pour. We're starting to sound like an ordinary claim or a common claim, and it's a very common claim. It's one of the reasons why I became, started to become intellectually convinced that there was a God prior to me becoming a Christian, because I read a lot about, you know, I'm interested in a lot of different things, music, movies, books, things like that. And I would hear that a hundred times a week. Some creative person would describe themselves as a tool in the hand of God or a, a voice of God or something through which God pours. Now, these, I'm not talking about preachers because I wasn't reading any preachers or listening to any preachers. I'm talking about just everyday creative people like a Bob Dylan or even a Mick Jagger. I've heard even Mick Jagger say that. Yeah, Mick Jagger. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Been around for long, long years. So many a man's 
So the ways that Mick Jagger, the devil himself, ah, run away, <laughs> that Mick Jagger, yeah. Um, anyways, okay, so where was I? So oftentimes a powerfully creative person will describe themselves as a conduit through which divine energy pours, a vessel, as merely a vessel for metaphorical eternal truths, Wisdom truths, however you want to phrase it. But here's where the rubber meets the road and it gets pretty interesting. Because one of the things that Jordan Peterson pointed out in his debate, and it's completely true, is how we rank these artists. You know, there's a difference. You, you like reading Harold Robbins, for example. Well, there's a really big difference between Harold Robbins and William Shakespeare. Harold Robbins, if you don't know, who kind of sucks. <laughs> okay, he wrote, uh, what did he write? I think he wrote The Lonely Lady. Pretty sure that's him. It's terrible. It's trashy. Um, yeah, I dragged my friends to the movie to see it. The movie itself is absolutely the worst. It's the worst movie, one of the worst movies. My friends never forgave me. I think it was called The Lonely Lady. I'm pretty sure that's the book. But anyway, so how do we differentiate Shakespeare from Harold Robbins? Because Shakespeare writes, and he, in his writing, seems to find these phrases or these passages or key parts of his writing that seem to speak in general to the human condition as a whole. He seems to find in his writing wisdom truths that everybody seems to recognize as profoundly true and in some way transcendentally true. Transcendentally true pretty much obviously because they speak to us across time. Bang. Bang. When we say a writer stands the test of time, that's what we mean. That some of the things that he found in his writing speak to us across time. That seems to strongly imply that there is such a thing as a wisdom truth or an eternal truth or something that speaks across time and a writer can tap into it. That's already starting to nudge at the reality of what I'm talking about. But let's, let's explore further. Let's take, this is why I was starting to become intellectually convinced that there was a God, by the way. I read, for example, a lot of poetry. And let's just take William Butler Yeats, T.S. Eliot, two best poets of the 20th century as far as I'm concerned. Um, T.S. Eliot, for example, there is a line from when you are reading a poem, this is kind of what happens. Okay, boring, 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 lame, lame line, boring line, blah, 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 flowery this, flower that. And then all of a sudden you'd be like, whoa, what's that? And there's some sort of really powerful, profound line. And those are usually things that are their famous lines, and those are how we rank the poems. Because the writer seems to tap into something that's powerful, abstract, and we recognize it immediately as something profound and a wisdom truth. Or tapping into something like that. For example, T.S. Eliot, there's a line, uh, I am no prophet and here is no great matter. I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. Uh, no, I've seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I've seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. First time I read that, I was like, wow, that, that's, that's fucked up. <laughs> that's what I was like. <laughs> Part of my branch. I was like, wow, that's messed up. That's powerful. Recognize it immediately as powerful. It's one of the key phrases in uh, Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. A fantastic poem, by the way. Um, and it is how we rank poets. Do they tap into some sort of universally recognizable metaphorical truth realm that speaks to us across time and across cultures? And that's how we rank them. That's how we would decide. 300 years hence, we're going to be reading T.S. Eliot. Why? Because that particular phrase will still speak to people. It speaks to something general about the human condition. It's very similar idea to what's in, for example, To Be or Not to Be, why we consider Hamlet the famous soliloquy in Hamlet. Um... You know, whether it's his noble in the mind to suffer sins and hours uh, of outrageous fortune by opposing end them. To die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance a dream. Ah, therein lies the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come. That's the key line. It's a very similar idea to the thing in T.S. Eliot. Uh, the general gist of both concepts. In, in Hamlet, the guy is debating whether to kill himself. And he says, what happens after you die, I'm terrified of but that the dread of something after death, when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must truly give us pause. See? It's exactly what he's saying. And that speaks to us. Because why? It's something general about the human condition. What happens when you die? I don't know. I'm afraid. Therefore, I won't kill myself. That's what Hamlet goes. Therefore, I won't kill myself. Now, T.S. Eliot, 
Different person, different time and place. Same idea. I've seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. Very similar idea. Powerfully worded. Uh, that's all for now. I'll get more into this in a different video. Um, yeah, it was, it was going okay, but I'm running out of time. All right, come on.